It turned out that a major group in society was indeed capable of acquiring all the skills, all the knowledge, <coughs> at all levels to actually take part in society. It's very <coughs> hard to overestimate the radical nature of these three big processes of inclusion, peasants, workers, women. In all three processes, it completely turned the society upside down. When the women, for real, became part of the society and part of power, it not only changed politics, it changed the way society was constructed, it changed every family, it changed any uh, marriage, it changed any company, it profoundly changed the society that we were and turned into the society we became at the turn of the century. And that society at the turn of the century is very particular because it is founded on these processes of inclusion and it is very much marked by the very strong self-consciousness of ordinary people feeling themselves, or rather insisting to be citizens in the real term, a sense of the term, being part of society. Now what does that entail? And I'll conclude by giving you a few figures from the turn of the century. Um, and don't, don't get back on me with statistics if you are Googling something, and Finland or Sweden, maybe uh, a, a, a 0.4, the percent above us, but just to give you a sense. At the turn of the century, because of these processes, these processes of inclusion, Denmark was the country in the world with the highest rate of employment. It still is. In no country in the world are more, a higher percentage of adults part of the production. Danes work. Danes participate. That's one thing. In no country in the world do you have more people on public announcements. Nowhere in the world do you have society where more high percentage of the population receive public announcements for not working. Seems like a contradiction in terms, it's not. The two figures are very closely interrelated. We have built a society in which you either work or you are a maternity leave, a pensioner, sick, uh, or on the way from one employment to another, being re-educated, retrained operated, and so forth. In, in all these situations, you are basically paid a government allowance. In no country in the world do you pay higher taxes. <laughs> because this system has to be financed, which basically means, if you're very bothered here, that you pay half of your income in taxes. Little more if you're rich, little less if you're poor. But not much less and not much more. So you basically pay half your income in taxes. In no country in the world is a higher percentage of the gross national products administered by the government. So Half of the Danish economy is a public economy. It's huge. Which means that the government basically runs all big facilities in society. Education, health, social welfare. All of it is government paid, tax paid, all of it is free and public. At the same time, we 
they are one of the most liberal economies in Europe. In very few countries in the world do you have less government ownership of production. So it's not like in France and elsewhere where you have, or China or other countries where you have big state or companies, you almost don't. So you have high taxation, very, very elaborate regulation, but virtually no public ownership of production. And with this series of strange records, we were and have been for the last 20 years in the top 10 most competitive economies in the world. So we have a society that's very much like a knife standing on the on, on this side. Either you work on your public allowance, a very high tax, a very big public sector, a an extremely well trained welfare system, an extremely regulated economy, high expenses of labor, high de facto minimum wages. There is no minimum wage in Denmark. Uh, everything is negotiated between strong trade unions and strong employers organizations. There's no government regulation of the labor market. It's a very liberal labor market. But with strong trade unions that will come after you if you try not to negotiate a collective bargaining with your employers. And this system, strangely, works. It works to create a highly efficient uh, economy where we actually get investment and production and have a very strong economy. Created not by wealth of nature, but by a strong democracy and a strong welfare. Now, of course, everyone keeps asking themselves, can this prevail in an open, globalized economy? Can Danish workers with salaries four, five times the price of a Chinese or a Malaysian or an Indian worker in a globalized economy keep competing? Nobody knows the answer. That's what Danish that politics is all about. But the strange thing is that in the elections that we have upcoming now, strangely between the Peasants Party and the Social Democrats, still competing for power uh, in those elections, the main theme is not whether to dismantle the welfare to keep our competitive edge. That's not even at the table for discussion. It's about two basic positions against each other. The left, the Social Democrats saying, we can and should maintain welfare based on a public sector at the size we have today and with the taxes that we have today. And the right peasants say, or not peasants anymore, the liberals, they call themselves, uh, uh, say we should maintain welfare and we can maintain welfare public welfare, but we can do it more efficiently and with lower taxes. So less of our economy is public and the citizens are allowed to keep more in their wallet um, and we can perform our welfare system more efficiently and more economically for lower taxes. So the discussion is not about welfare or not welfare, it's about how to finance the, the welfare, how to run it. More for private money or more for public money. That's what the discussion is, not whether to maintain the system or not. Now, of course, the politicians can turn out to get it wrong, and my image with the knife standing on the edge, <coughs> of course, means that you can all imagine, without being postgraduates in national economy, that if you have taxes at that level, and public expenditures at that level, the 
difference between those working and those in public, there are public announcements, the, the balance between the two is pretty crucial for the company. I mean, it means a lot whether you move a couple of thousand from one group to the other. <coughs> being a public announcers to the ones working or the ones working to be the public announcers. So very much also depends on how you actually maintain that balance. And again, there there is a big difference between the left and the left, right. The left saying, when people do not work, it's actually not because they do not want to work. It's because they don't have the skills, the social conditions, the health, the situation, the training. So the basic thing we can do to move people from being a public allowances to working, the best thing we can do is to train them, educate them, operate them, help them. And the people the right will be saying, this is all very good, but maybe it would also incentivize them a little bit if we got the announcers. And the difference between working and being an announcer is, 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 is growing. And this is not trivial, because if you push down the announcers, you of course create a different kind of society. And this is a very strong political debate. It is actually a question of getting people to be more poor, getting the bigger incentive to work. Or do people actually want to work and profit from working if they are trained, if they are allowed, if they actually find a place to go to work? So this is the political debate. We have actually come up uh, within a couple of months. And once again, there is much to face these fundamental questions. And the electorate will decide with very, very small margins whether to tilt a little bit in one way or a little bit the other way. But one thing that is almost certain is that more than 80% of the days will turn out on election day. They will vote on one of the 10, some 10, 18 parties because they all feel part of this debate and part of this equation. And that fundamentally is what democracy is about. It's not about the age. It's not about the political parts and the roles. It's about the people. Thank you. I have education as the point to become emancipated a part of the democratic society. How is that that at this moment is migrants in this country? That is of course the obvious question. And uh, and, uh, and and one which doesn't have an easy answer. There are a, uh, there are obvious similarities in the sense that you have again a group in society everybody knows cannot be part of power because they are not educated. Blah, blah, blah. And of course we know that this is not right, and that we have a reserve of intelligent, high productive. <coughs> members of society, if we can get it right, and we've been very bad at getting it right. So in that sense, there is a clear parallel and an obvious conclusion. But the conclusion is less obvious if you remember a couple of, of aspects that are very different. First, the immigrants, though many, are still a small minority. The peasants was a majority. The workers almost the majority, the women at least half. <laughs> so these were groups in society that were completely embedded in society. I mean, they were not somebody outside society trying to get into it. They were part of society wanting to change their role within society. The immigrants, by the very nature of them being immigrants, are people who are coming to the country and they are, compared to these three groups, a minority. That's one big difference. Another is that the immigrants, of course, are not just immigrants. They are immigrants from a lot of very, very different places with very different backgrounds and very different individual histories and qualifications and, and attitudes to society. And the fact is that some groups of immigrants do extremely well in society. They've come, they have integrated, 
and be part of society at all levels. The second and third generation is already deeply engaged in society without a problem. So they are, in a sense, to run made immigrants, they are part of society. The problem is that other groups are not and have enormous difficulties making the transition from where they came from to this highly productive society where the demands are very high. And I'll give you just one example why this is not true. If you come as an uneducated immigrant to the US, for example, next day you are sitting in a yellow cap and you work and you get a very, very lousy salary. If any, what you work, because you have the prospect of getting a little higher salary, and you want to work because of the kids, and you want them to make it in the US. If the same immigrant arrives in Denmark, we will tell you, you know what? You can work here when you learn Danish, got yourself an education, and are able to find yourself a work that will pay you a full salary that will allow you to sustain your family. Means that the first ladder on the labor market, the first step into the labor market is extremely high. And for someone who doesn't speak the language,